Jordan, welcome to the Kevin Smith Show. Well, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate your inviting me and happy to be with you. And, uh, yeah, controversy has followed me all my life, but uh, it's just who I am and that's what I do. I don't even care about uh, what people think about me anymore. I just... I just uh, have always loved wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and I've came to uh, the knowledge that uh, so much of really real wisdom and understanding and knowledge has been hidden from us, uh, you know, for hundreds of years. So that's why I do what I do, and the the controversy that surrounds me is actually uh, something called cognitive dissonance which simply means if you're hearing something for the first time that you've never heard before, obviously it must be crazy because you've never heard it before. And obviously, since you know everything there is to know about everything on the entire earth, and you have the whole truth, and anything that you've never heard, obviously, uh, has, it's, it's, uh, it's stupid and there's no need to even listen to it because you've never heard it before. But I've come to the conclusion a long time ago that the world of mankind <clears throat> has been purposely lied to and deceived and distracted. And uh, so I started looking into the dark side a long time ago, back in 1959, uh, at 19 years old. I began reading and studying the world of the occult. Occult simply means hidden. Look it up in a dictionary. It doesn't mean evil or devil worship or anything just simply means hidden. And so much of real knowledge and understanding has been hidden. And therefore, it is controversial when you start talking about the truth. Uh, you know, like uh, in the movie, uh, Mike Nich uh, Nicholson said, you know, you can't handle the truth. Well, I'll give, you an, uh, I'll give you a secret that I've learned over many years. It's a secret, but I'll share it with you. People will always support what they want to hear. They will not support what they don't want to hear. Uh, if they, if you like opera, you're not going to pay fifty bucks for a rap concert, you know. And if, if you like country western, you're not going to pay uh, thirty dollars for a rock and roll concert. People will pay money to hear what they want to hear. They will not pay money to hear something they don't want to hear. And all of the ancient writings and holy writings of all the ancient peoples of the world have always stated the one thing, generally speaking, that people on the earth do not want to hear is the truth. And so, therefore, anyone who's dealing with truth is uh, going to be going up uh, against the whole world of ignorance that's been planned and... Um, so that's that's where the well, and not only planned, uh, it's also embraced. Um, there are people who are ignorant of the facts, know they are ignorant of the facts, and it's a family tradition, and they're proud of it. Of course, absolutely. They embrace yeah. the ignorance. Yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, we have the metaphors and symbolic stories, even in the Bible, talking about that, about the war between light and darkness, and. There's even a, a, a place in the scriptures that talks about when Pontius Pilate uh, brings out the, the two prisoners to the town to release one, one, one prisoner. On the one hand, you have Jesus who says, I am the truth and the light. And then on the other hand, you have Barabbas, which everybody in town knew was a criminal from day one. Uh, and so Pontius Pilate says to the, uh, to the crowd in the city, I have two people, two prisoners. Which one should I release to you? Barabbas, the criminal, or Jesus, the truth and the light? And the scripture says, with one voice, the entire town said, give us Barabbas. Well, that's a symbolic metaphor. It's a symbolic story telling you that when the people of the town, of any town, are presented with one of two things to choose from, the, the, the criminality, stupidity, and ignorance that we've always dealt with with the human race, or, on the other hand, with the truth and the light, the town will always pick the, the darkness, the, the criminality. 
people will always love to vote for uh, the guy who's going to change everything. He's going to change and make things better. And for 200 years, Americans have been crawling on their knees, voting to change and make things better. And the more we change, the more we stay the same. We're still broke. We're getting broker by the day. The rich get richer. The poor get poorer. The entire system is so corrupt now that it's all, even people in the middle of nowhere know the entire world system is corrupt. It's not getting any better. Christians are praying to their God to protect them, to protect their homes, and, and to take care of their country and their lives. And the more they pray to their God, the worse things get each day, because the, the, uh, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the, and the evil is growing leaps and bounds, corruption leaps and bounds. And the good people just crawl on their knees and wait for something to happen to save them. Okay, well now, that, that's a good point to insert. They always say, give us Barabbas. All right, that's a, good, that's a good point for me to insert this issue that I brought up. I've, I've watched over the years a number of uh, videos where you're speaking. I've listened to you on radio. And I know that you talk very often about the occult background, uh, the occult underpinning of what many people refer to as the New World Order. Um, and it appears to me, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out and, and get, your, get your response to it. It appears to me that there's, at the moment, a convergence of several streams here. Um, we, we hear all about the New World Order and their, their plans that most people, I think, would say, now that's evil. Uh, their plans for the future, and um, we have heard now for quite some time that there is a plan to um, unite humanity uh, and and under a one world government, and and that the plan is um, has several pillars to it, and one of them is collapse of the world economy. Uh, another is uh, an attack from a hostile enemy from space, in other words, hostile aliens, and that this is a false flag. It's all being manufactured. Okay, now that's what we've heard. And then right now we're watching as the world economy is uh, pretty much in shambles and, and crumbling more uh, by the day. We're watching that. We're watching... Uh, as uh, the governments of the world now are using this WikiLeaks thing to uh, grab for control of the Internet, um, more and more legislation, less and less freedom. And as these things converge, it kind of forces me to ask the question, could this be the opening salvo in such a false flag operation. What do you think about that? Well, many years ago, um, I, I sat with a large group of uh, speakers and, and, and military people at a big conference in Pasadena. And we all went out to dinner one night and was sitting there at a big, big table filled with people. And all of these are all professionals and, and teachers and, and uh, as I said, military. And... Um, Norio Hayakawa, uh, you may have heard his name. Oh, yeah, he's, he's been on the show. Been of, yeah, he's always been one of the uh, the leading uh, spokesmen for this idea that there would be a um, false flag uh, attack from aliens or out of space or whatever, <clears throat> and that this would be the premise for a, uh, a hostile takeover of the world that would all be planned, and it's just a silly charade. And so he was talking about that. This was back in 1990, 91. And he was talking about that that night at the table. And, and I said to him, I said, Norio, I could take the same facts that you're using and come up with a different conclusion that I think is equally as plausible. Suppose uh, that there is, in fact, going to be an alien invasion. Let us just suppose that there is, in fact, aliens who are planning on invading our Earth. 
uh, that, first of all, is not out of the uh, realm of possibility, because even in the scriptures in the Bible, it talks about the demonic realm, the angels, the fallen angels. Well, where are angels? They're, well, they're out there. They don't come from Cleveland. They come from out there. You know, ask any six-year-old where God is, and they point to the heavens. God's out there. Well, if God's out there, and the demons, and the devil, and, and, the, and the good angels are with God, well, then they're out there. And they're smarter than we are, far more clever, uh, far more powerful. And if they're out there, that means they're extraterrestrial. Uh, so we use the term spirits and angels and demons and whatever. But whatever it is we're talking about, they're out there. They're not here. And they're superior to us. Well, we know that's in Christianity and Judaism and, and even in Islam. Uh, realizes that there are higher intelligences in the universe watching us, good and evil, and mm -hmm. God. So the whole concept of somebody out there watching us and perhaps planning uh, something for us that we don't have any control over is not out of the realm of possibility in my mind. So I said to him, Suppose there's going to, in fact, be a, an invasion, and this government knows it, and the military knows it, and around the world, world leaders know it, and suppose they were given the alternative of, uh, of fighting it, or prepare your people for it, prepare your people for it so that no one is going to lose their mind when, <clears throat> when they see what's happening. Uh, well, we're talking about the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes back and when the heavenly armies come back. And so I'm saying there's, there's still too much yet we haven't nailed down. That I, that I think that there's at least a possibility that there may be some kind of an other world uh, presence that is planning our demise. I mean, like I said, uh, going back to the Bible. If you're talking about the demonic realm and the devil and the demons and all that kind of thing, uh, and they are they are evil and want to uh, cause destruction on the earth, well, I mean, that's in the Bible, for God's sake. So um, you know, maybe there is something to, uh, to this idea of extraterrestrial evil uh, presence out there that's uh, planning on some kind of a of a world catastrophe that they're going to cause and then come in. Uh, so I just think that there's way too much we haven't looked at, and nothing, as far as I'm concerned, is black or white. Well, it, you know, if we take that, uh, if we take the the um, uh, story in Revelation, um, just just for the sake of discussion, let's let's take it as fact. If we take that as fact, then what you have is uh, the governments of the world working in concert with and participating in this invasion um, of of uh, what most people would call evil uh, and actually setting up a government that has earthly representatives so that there is a human face on the government of this evil force. That's right. That's right. And suppose the government has no alternative. They, have, they are confronted by a far superior intellect and far superior technology from out there, from somewhere out there has come uh, uh, what we refer to, as, a, for lack of a better term, alien. Well, of course, angels and spirits and demons and, and, uh, and God and would be alien to our little human, little... Um, manifestation here on the earth so anything out there that's far superior and, and profoundly wonderful or profoundly evil and it's from out there and they're coming well that's in the bible that's in the the it's in all the holy writings of the world <clears throat> so the idea is not that foreign to me and and, it, and it's very possible that something like this is being prepared and the governments are as equal evil as they are. Governments are corporations. And all corporations operate on one basis, to continue staying in existence. All corporations uh, want to stay in existence. They, you know, they're not interested in the good of the people. So the governments want to stay in power in government, but they know something is coming 
and they have no control over it. Jordan, when we went away for break, uh, you had uh, proposed the idea, what if something truly is coming and is um, somewhat hostile to us, maybe very hostile to us, and um, uh, the governments think they have no choice but to try and prepare us to cooperate with these things. Um, would it be um, out of the realm of being reasonable and rational to just ask, so what happens if they were to just say, no, we're not going to cooperate? Yeah, well, <clears throat> if you're confronted by uh, technology, which is a thousands and thousands of years in the future of your future, and you know the, the profound uh, power that this alien power has and can at any moment uh, do damage to this earth like you cannot imagine, uh, <clears throat> what are you going to do? Are you going to stay in power and, and keep your cushy lifestyle and be the politicians and just uh, acquiesce and just go along to get along because if you don't, uh, you know, it's going to cause more trouble than if you do. And so since there's nothing you can do about it, and the, and the opposition is so, uh, so far advanced that uh, nothing you've got in your arsenal is, even comes near what they can do, uh, you know, it, w it would be stupid on the, on the face of it for you to uh, think you'll say, well, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, are you kidding? The politicians are so corrupt today, they'll do anything for a buck. I can imagine what they would do if they're confronted by, you know, something uh, other, otherworldly that they have no control over. I mean, you know as well as I do, they can be bought and sold for money easy. <laughs> well, let me ask this then. What would be the purpose behind keeping all of the UFO stuff secret? What, what's the purpose for the truth embargo about UFOs and extraterrestrials? Uh, probably, probably, uh, a, a dear friend of mine came up with, a, with an idea that I think is plausible. That they, and in doing what they have been doing, they have been making it public that something is happening by merely uh, denying something everybody sees with their own eyes uh, is pretty much uh, telling you, you know, they're, they're letting you know by, by saying no. Sometimes uh, a person saying no to something that's so obvious is telling you something. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was having dinner with uh, Colonel Tom Bearden many years ago. And uh, <clears throat> he's a science, he's a physicist, physicist. He's top of the line uh, uh, scientist for America, and, and there was a lot of other scientists at the table. And I asked him, I said, um, uh, Tom, I said, can you tell me anything definitive about the uh, Philadelphia experiment, whether that, any of that was true or not? And he said to me in front of everyone, there's about ten different scientists at the table. And he said, Jordan, I'm not at liberty to talk about that, so um, you know, I don't want to comment on that. Well, being stupid and younger, I, I opened my mouth just to change feet. So I said to him, well, I don't want any national secrets, but is there anything you can tell me at all? And he said to me, Jordan, listen to what I'm saying. I cannot talk about that subject, so drop it. Well, <clears throat> I, of course, felt like a fool. But I, I was asking for it. But in fact, he answered my question because a man of that stature is saying, I have nothing to say on that subject, period, so drop it, means that uh, I got to him. I mean, uh, he's telling me, don't talk about this. So as far as I'm concerned, that tells me that the Philadelphia experiment was legitimate. And he's not talking in front of other people. He's not talking at all. Mm-hmm. So I'm saying that when someone says um, that there is nothing to this UFO and the government's covering it up and acting like they, well, then they're not actually covering it up. They are making it obvious that something is wrong because every time you get uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, documents, they're all blanked out with black. So there is something legitimately important really going on here. 
and I believe that it has to do with extraterrestrial life forms who are here and who are doing something with us and to us. And I don't think it's uh, I don't think they're good. I think that they are evil. Uh, but then again, they may not be evil. It's, it's like a, it's like an insect or an animal. The animal is just what it is. It is what it is. It's not evil. It just does what it does. And, and so uh, uh, lizards aren't evil. They're just not human. So they don't they don't think like we do. Well, maybe these aliens, if there are, if these are aliens or demons or demonic spirits or whatever. Uh, maybe they just don't even think like humans. They, they just come here to do what they're going to do. And if you're not bigger than they are, if you're not more, you know, uh, prepared uh, militarily to deal with them, then they're just going to come do what they're going to do, whether you like it or not. And if they're highly intelligent, uh, they would also not want to confront an Earth filled with, with crazy people killing themselves and, and destroying everything. So I would think that an, uh, an uh, approaching military establishment of that kind and that power would uh, would deal with the governments and say, "Look, at, we're coming in." That's what Hitler did. That's what the <clears throat> that's what the uh, the communists did when they were taking over. They would send in uh, you know people uh, ahead of the troops to say, "Look, at, we're coming in tomorrow. Tell your people not to fight, and we won't kill them." Uh, well, maybe that's what's happening. Maybe there, and, and I know that people like Steven Spielberg are a lot of things, but stupid isn't one of them. And if Steven Spielberg is spending as much money, and the studios around the world are spending as much money on Spielberg's work as they are, uh, with him talking about, uh, you know, he did that 19 hour television series called Taken. Yeah. And then uh, uh, E.T and Close Encounters, and all the other UFO materials that Steven Spielberg is dealing with. Uh, you know, I happen to know something about Steven Spielberg. He's not a fool. He's telling you something. Uh, and people say, well, it's just a bunch of entertainment. Yeah, well, Spielberg himself said uh, publicly, he says, I'm not making movies to entertain I make movies to comment on, on important uh, subjects of the day. So I'm just saying that it very well might be that what we're seeing is a a a, um, uh, a planned uh, expose and done in such a way as to because you have to look at the what's happened today. People are now all over the world aware that there very well might be aliens, and we've got television shows and movies telling us about the visitors and V and all that kind of thing. Uh, there very well might be, uh, so the uh, world population is aware of that. Nobody's jumping off of buildings. Nobody's killing each other for it. But they are aware of it, so maybe it's a very clever military government operation to make us aware that there is something coming. And, uh, and again, I hate to go back to it again, but if that be the case, uh, well, that's what the Bible said was going to happen, that there would come a day when some great catastrophe would come on the earth, uh, you know, in the last days, the end times, and all that kind of thing. So I'm just saying there's too much gray area that we don't, in fact, really know. And I'm not one for taking uh, things at face value, because I know there's a lot, there's usually a bigger story behind the story. All right, well, let's talk about a bigger story behind the story. Say that again. Let's take a look at a bigger story behind the story. We uh, hear a lot that the ancient mystery schools knew about extraterrestrials, and we've heard some stories that they were in contact with them and may still be. What do you think about that? I think that's true. I think that's exactly right. I think that's what's happening today. Uh, I wish I could tell you some of the things that I've been told by very famous people that you would know. Some very famous people in uh, in the uh, in the truth movement, and pe very famous movie stars, and famous politicians, and military people. Some really very well known famous people that, and I and I have talked with them in private. I wish I could tell you what they have told me. I could not and will not. Uh, but uh, because it would be shocking to people. Uh, but. 
I wouldn't mind telling you off the air, but uh, and so from what I have been able to gather from these famous people that you would uh, quickly know, uh, who have told me about their one-on-one -on -one experience with aliens and that they are here, um, I don't know. I'm just telling you what these people said, and, mm -hmm. and I can tell you a lot of different names and uh, experiences that I, I've heard people talk about. I could tell you some really strange stories about Ronald Reagan and Ronald and Nancy Reagan and uh, it would blow your mind. And, uh, and some of the most famous people in the world and movies and motion pictures I've talked with. So I'm just saying that there's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's too much that has not been told in the court of public opinion. The people of the nation, of this country, have not been given all of the information, all of the relevant information to make a decision. They're only making the decision on what they've been told, and most, as you know, uh, of what they've been told is, is either concocted or, or given to them by government or some screwball. But uh, the real truth and the real legitimate uh, experiences that famous and important people around the world are having are not being told to the American people. They're not being given this kind of information. I well, I, I want to explore that again. I don't understand what's the benefit of keeping it a secret. Well, I said, by keeping it a secret, it's actually getting out. Yeah, but I if they decided to put it out, of, it would also get out. Uh, well, I think it's a way of the government doesn't come out and say, yes, we are dealing with extraterrestrials, yes, it's true. Uh, but by trying to keep covering it up, and every time somebody gets a Freedom of Information uh, um, documents, it's all blanked out, as you pro probably know. It's all blacked out, and there's only one or two lines on each page that you can read, and the rest of it's all blacked out. Well, that's telling you that there is something very legitimate and real about this subject, and government knows it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, over the past 50 years, the government has, has, in a very strange and mystical way, the government has allowed all of this kind of knowledge to come out. And, and they've allowed the Hollywood, or even promoted Hollywood, to do this by making all these sci-fi movies and science movies and Spielberg and George Lucas with, uh, with Indiana Jones and all that kind of thing. Um, so the, the ideas and the concepts have leaked out to the whole world, and I think the government wanted it that way without actually coming out and saying anything. What is the bottom line? What's at the end of the day is the bottom line? The bottom line is that the whole world is now aware that there very well might be some kind of an alien invasion. Well, the government allowed that to happen. And so I'm just saying that there is at least enough evidence on the opposite side to suggest that there very well might be something demonic and something de you know, evil coming uh, to this world. And again, it's in the scriptures. It's in all the ancient scriptures, not just the Bible. So I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I personally, and this is just a, uh, my, my uh, subjective opinion, but I personally believe that we are being watched by alien life forms. They are here. As far as I'm concerned, they are here. All right. Welcome back to the Kevin Smith Show. My guest this evening is Jordan Maxwell, and uh, we're exploring, I guess you could say, the uh, so, some of the dark side of the whole UFO extraterrestrial uh, information. <clears throat> Jordan, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Mike Byra and uh, Richard Hoagland's book called Dark Mission. Yep, know them both very well. Mm -hmm. The premise of that book is that there is something occult behind what NASA's doing in space. And they detail it with uh, certain evidences, for instance, all of the uh, launch dates, the landing dates during the Apollo program, and even since then, uh, some of the landing sites and landing dates on Mars uh, for our, our missions to Mars. <clears throat> uh, 
it all seems to be related to having Sirius, the star Sirius, at 19.5 degrees above the landing site, or if they land at 19.5 degrees on the planet, having Sirius either at 33 degrees above the horizon or 33 degrees below the horizon. Pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, string of um, information that they provide in that book. First, what do you make of that information? And if it's if that's the case, what do you make of what's going on at NASA? Well, first of all, if you go on my website to uh, go on my website at the top of the page, you'll see a button that says audio video. And that's a bunch, a bunch of audio and video clips. And if you scroll down on the audio video page, you will see a picture uh, and it's a, um, it's a uh, video for about 20 minutes long of a, um, uh, an award show where I was given a Lifetime Achievement Award. It's called the uh, uh, Maverick Award. And at that Maverick Award, which you can watch on my website on the audio video page, Richard Hoagland came up to speak about me at the award show. And he said to the audience that much of the occult stuff that uh, he talks about today was actually got, he got it from Jordan Maxwell. And he said, I'm, I'm happy to say that I uh, don't mind admitting that uh, much of the, uh, you know, the occult stuff that we are now talking about today um, I was involved with the, the heavy science, but I didn't know about the occult stuff until I talked with Jordan. And so much of what he's talking about today, I know I, I was the one telling him about this stuff many years ago. So uh, when, when I'm totally sure that he's right, that there is a, an occult significance to all the numbers and, and where they're landing and all that kind of thing. But he's the scientist, not me. I'm just the one that made him aware back in 1990, I think it was, at, at a lecture he came to, when I first met him, he came to a, a lecture of mine in Santa Monica in which I was talking about NASA and the secret societies and fraternal orders coming out of Berlin and Germany when they came to America through on, on the Operation Paperclip and how the Nazis were heavy into uh, the occult uh, establishment in Europe, and they were using that to set up like something the Nazis called NASA. And, and it's an incredible story of all the high, uh, high uh, technology, occultism, mysticism, that went into, and of course, all, all you've got to do is know about uh, uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, which you probably know was originally not Jet Propulsion Lab, it was Jack Parsons' lab. And Jack L. Parsons was a rocketeer. He was, he was heavy into uh, um, researching fuel for rockets, and he loved rocketry, but he was also into very heavily involved in the occult world. And he was in Pasadena, and uh, uh, he had two partners. Uh, the three of these guys were the triumvirate uh, who created what we call Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL. But JPL originally was uh, Jack Parsons' lab. And Jack Parsons had um, L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology, who was heavy into occultism, mysticism, uh, strange uh, sex rituals, all kinds of really dark stuff, and uh, Alistair Crowley, Alistair Crowley of, of England. Uh, Alistair Crowley, um, L. Ron Hubbard, and Jack L. Parsons were all friends working, and they were incredibly deep into the dark stuff. And it became known as Jack Parsons' lab, and today it's become Jet Propulsion Lab. So the whole idea of NASA, Jet Propulsion Lab, rocketry, uh, NASA, all of this is goes back to a very dark uh, occultism, mysticism, man, mankind communicating with spirits who are out there, wanting uh, mankind wanting to go out there into space. And, com and commune with the great spirits and the and the uh, and the extraterrestrial 
life forms who are out there. So all of, that's where all of this stuff comes from. Now, today, of course, we look at NASA, and it looks to be very official, and it's the government, and we're doing wonderful things by, by, by going to the moon and all that silly stuff, when, in fact, it has nothing to do with any of that. NASA, Jet Propulsion Lab, the whole space uh, thing is based on an occult, highly intelligent, occult, mystical movement by some very powerful people behind the scenes that you don't even know exist who are trying to make communication and some kind of a of a an alliance with extraterrestrials. And there's a lot of information on that that's not privy to the to the public to know about. Let's talk about these people that are behind the scenes. Uh because obviously not everyone who works at NASA is involved in the occult. No, of course okay. not. I'm saying so, but some, I yeah, but someone is choosing these landing sites. A long time ago, many years. Someone's choosing the landing sites. Somebody's choosing the launch dates. Somebody's choosing the landing dates. And it seems obvious that they are, in fact, very, very keyed in. Now, um, Mike Barra points out uh, in his seminars, and uh, it's pointed out in his book, that uh, during the Apollo program, those launch dates and landing sites and so forth were chosen by an Egyptian working at NASA by the name of Dr. Farouk, I believe it's Abbas. And uh, his father was an expert in uh, Osiris mystery of religion. Well, that's the yeah. mm-hmm. Now, no, Osiris so. is said uh, to reside in Orion's uh, constellation, and right. his consort, his wife, actually, who is his sister, is Isis and is uh, said to reside on the star system Sirius. And so all of this stuff seems to be related to Sirius, which links it to Osiris. Yeah. Uh, wh- what's the deal with that? I mean, uh, th- that's that one guy. Is there anyone else at NASA oh, besides yeah. Dr. Farouk Abbas? Oh, heavens, yes. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the mathematics, which is required for this kind of, uh, of uh, space uh, exploration, the mathematics is on a very high level. And, it's, and, it's, uh, and, and I am told by NASA uh, physicists, and scientists that uh, they're using Hindu mathematics. A lot of the mathematics uh, that uh, is used in the space program is based on the Hindu math. And uh, the how does that differ? Occult, uh, a lot of occultism, uh, ancient mysticism. The very the very word Osiris is where we get our word sir, S I R. S-I-R yes sir, no sir comes from Osiris. Osiris. Welcome back to the Kevin Smith Show. My guest this evening is Jordan Maxwell, and we are talking about some pretty deep stuff here. Uh, And uh, Jordan, uh, I had to cut you off uh, because the break took over. But let me me ask you uh, to recap now. You you mentioned that they are using Hindu um, mathematics uh, to do all of their launches and landing sites and stuff. Uh, how does that differ from our mathematics? Well, I'm not sure because I'm not the scientist, but uh, this is what the scientists have told me, that, uh, that, uh, that the Hindu math is so extraordinarily uh, brilliant uh, based on the ancient, ancient uh, understanding mm-hmm. uh, of mathematics dealing with space-time uh, that we are just trying to understand. You know, we're, that, that's that's the way modern day man operates. We're trying to understand the brilliance of the ancient world. You know, and we've been told by our, by our religions and our governments that that man is evolving. He's he's getting smarter and smarter as we go. Well, in point of fact, actually, factually, uh, we're, we're doing just the opposite. Uh, mankind thousands and thousands of years ago was far, far superior 
and intellect and technology than we can even dream of today. But we're not being told that. That's being kept, uh, that's along with all the other stuff that's been kept from us. We're not being told that the Hindus had more uh, understanding of the universe and the time-space continuum and how the world actually worked. The ancient Egyptians uh, had knowledge that we haven't even begun to understand. Uh, they built things around the world, pyramids, that we can't even uh, duplicate today. Uh, there are great palaces and great uh, temples in the oceans of the world. There was a pyramid on the, on, the, on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean, 10 miles north of the island of Bimini in the Bahama Banks. There's just all kinds of profound wisdom and knowledge that the ancient, uh, ancient people had that we don't even begin to scrape the surface of today. But we don't want people knowing that we're stupid. So we put it out for all the children in the school, little silly, nonsensical tribe that says that we are the ultimate brilliance on the, on the, in the planet, and we are the ultimate brilliance in all the universe. There's nothing like us. When in point of fact, no, the ancient Egyptians forgot more about science and technology and, uh, and the entire ancient world was far, far more advanced than we can even begin to hope to, to do today. So when I see people who think that we are the uh, epitome of brilliance, I said, no, you better look around and do some homework and start reading about the ancient Hindus, about the ancient Tibetans, about the ancient Egyptians and the Phoenician Canaanites and who these people were and, what, and where all of our technology has come from, has come from studying the ancient peoples. So as far as I'm concerned, there's a whole world of knowledge. We as Americans and as people today in America have no idea in the world what's going on. We haven't been told any truth in over 200 years. So as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't have any time for people who think that we are the best of the best and when there's nothing better than modern-day man. No, we are digressing. Now, I will agree with Christians that man did not evolve from chimps and monkeys. I believe man is evolving into chimps and monkeys. <laughs> I think that we are devolving. I think that we're getting more stupid by the day, more corrupt, more evil more self-centered, more egotistical, and I think that we are creating a crisis on the earth that somebody has to step in. Somebody out there is going to have to. If God created us, then if, it, if that God who created us wants his creation to continue, he may yet have to do what the Bible said he did before. He might have to come in and just clean the slate clear again, because we are so profound profoundly backwards and stupid and self-centered and egotistical and all-knowing and uh, corrupt, all like the Bible says, from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. There's not a well spot in you. So I'm just telling you the truth. The truth is, is that there's a lot of knowledge that mankind has not been privy to know and that those people who we would refer to as the illuminated minds, the Illuminati, you know, as evil as they may be, they are very, very bright. They are extraordinarily well-read. They're not stupid. And so the human race is up against a, a handful of people who are profoundly and extraordinarily bright and very, very smart on how to manipulate the human race and maybe making uh, deals with extraterrestrials. God knows what these people are doing. All right, well, let me ask you, what do you think is the most significant thing that we don't know that we need to know? Well, I, that, that's a good question. I think probably the most significant thing that we need to know is that the, the, the Earth has been a host to living creatures for billions of years. I, don't, I think that's the most important thing we need to know is that there has been extraordinary uh, life on this planet hundreds of millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago. 
this planet has been occupied by some extraordinary life forms that probably are a billion years old. So, you know, when we go back in our history, that's all our masters who believe they control and own the human race, our masters who give us our universities, our colleges, our, our educational and court systems, and our banking and governmental systems, the masters of the human race who think that we are nothing more than, than a cannon fodder, they have given us the idea that the last 6,000 years, man has come from somewhere. They never, they never nailed down where we came from. But we started off as little uh, cave people up in a mountain somewhere, <clears throat> and today we have finally reached the pinnacle of, of success. We are the best that God has ever created. Well, I think the most important sub single subject that needs to be looked at is the fact that there has been on this earth for hundreds of millions of years extremely high forms of life forms on this earth that will be so far different from anything you have ever even encountered, and that we as humans today are a very new creation. We, we do not have hundreds of millions of years of history. We are a very new creation. And that's what I wanted to talk about in relation to the rabbi friend of mine who brought this out to me back in 1965. He said, the Bible doesn't say in the Old Testament, the Bible doesn't say that God created man. Never said that. Go back and read it. It doesn't say God created man. It says, uh, and the big, uh, it says in Genesis 1.28, when God is creating Adam and Eve, it says, go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. In, in Genesis 9.1, 9, in Genesis 9.1, after the flood of Noah's day, when God has wiped out the, the uh, mankind with the great flood, when Genesis 9 went after the flood, says God said to, uh, to Noah and his family, <clears throat> because there are no humans now, they've all been wiped off the earth, God says, come, <clears throat> excuse me, God says, go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. So I asked the rabbi many years ago, is that a correct translation? When it says re, R-E, replenish, means do again. <clears throat> and he said yes. Replenish, obviously, because of God's wiped all mankind off the earth. If you're going to have mankind on the earth, then you're going to have to replenish the earth. So I said to him, if that be true then, why does it say in Genesis 1:28 when it's talking about God creating Adam and Eve? <clears throat> and God says to Adam and Eve, go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. Do it again. And the rabbi said that's precisely the point. Mankind is a new creation, but there has been life on this earth for hundreds of millions of years, different kinds of life forms that you have never even heard of. And they are far superior to anything that, that is existing on the earth today. I think that's important. Well, it, it's, you know, there are all kinds of clues in Genesis um, that the earth is much, much, much older. I found it uh, very interesting. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created, in the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that six days of so-called six days of creation, that doesn't start till verse 3. And there you have the earth in existence prior to the six days. Could have been there for billions of years. Of course. Of course. And when, and when, and when God says, God says when he's creating Adam and Eve, uh, he says, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Well, uh, Rabbi, the rabbi said to me, Go back and read that. That doesn't say man, uh, God is creating man. It, and he says uh, the emphasis on the, on the sentence should be that God said, come let us. Who is us? Yeah, it's plural. Uh, who is us? God said, come let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Mm-hmm. 
He doesn't say he's making man. No, he's saying, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, which implies that, that there is a man is already here, but there is an intervention and man's natural evolution at the intervention. God, whoever the God is, is saying, man is already here. We call him Neanderthal or, or, or cro -Magno. I don't care what these hominid creatures are that we know have existed. We know these uh, hominid creatures who have the skeletal remains like, uh, like a human. They look, they look sort of like human, but they're not exactly us. They were Neanderthal. And then all of a sudden, out of the Neanderthal era comes the modern day human. And we all, with writing classical music and going and designing lasers and, and, uh, and automobiles and television, where did, where did all of this, uh, this new creature come from? Well, the scripture clearly says in Genesis 1:28, God, whatever that is, God said, Come, let us make man in our image after our likeness and we now know that our dna has been tampered with and that we are somebody else's experiment you know because well god created us well somebody created us and according to the scriptures it looks like god is not what you think it is genesis 1 1 i'm telling you this is very interesting when you get into genesis 1 1 and one, two, as far as I'm concerned, that's a whole story in itself. Oh, you're right about that. You are right about that. One says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what it says in the original. The King James people were good at translating the, the King's English, but they weren't that hot on Hebrew. <laughs> so you go back and read it today with a better understanding of the language, and it's a little different. It doesn't say God created the heavens and the earth. It says in the beginning of the creation, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is not God. El is God. Elohim is a feminine plural. It's a plural, meaning the gods. And so when we, t we hear that the Hebrew people, the Jews, were the first monotheistic people, that is absolutely ludicrous on the face of it. Anyone who knows anything about comparative religions and has uh, studied theology understands that that is not true. The Hebrews were not the first monotheistic people. The word is heno. Write it down and do some research on it. H-E-N-O. Henotheistic, not monotheistic. Monotheistic means a worship of one God, but henotheistic, which is the correct term to use for Hebrews, Henotheistic means picking one god from many. So if you have 10 or 12 gods standing in line, and you pick the one you like, and you make a covenant with that god, and so that god says, all right, I will be your god, you will be my people, and I will not have any other gods now before me. No other gods. So you're not going to worship 12 now. You're only going to have me, so I will not have any, any other gods before me. And you agree, all right, there will not be any other gods we will have and we won't worship, it'll be just you. So the Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews, were a henotheistic, not monotheistic. So there is, you know, this whole idea of mono, meaning there's only one God in the universe. Well, the scripture says, the Apostle Paul says, there are many gods and many lords. And then he goes on to say, the Apostle Paul goes on to say, always be hospitable to all men, for some have entertained angels unaware. Meaning, always be hospitable to people you meet, because you might be talking to an angel who looks human. And you were conversing with an alien, an angel, who looked human. All through the Bible, uh, in the Old and New Testament, Angels look like men. They look like humans, even the bad ones. They took on women and, and procreated, we're told in Genesis. Well, that shows that plumbing worked like a man so that they could get the women pregnant. I can't imagine women being talked into bed by some evil, hideous sun creature from another world, but I can imagine the women falling for some good-looking, handsome man that they thought was human. But no, no, these angels, these angels were not angels. They were called sons of God. 
There's a big difference between the word in Hebrew for angel and sons of God. Sons of God were, the, were angels or spirits who took on human form and came down and messed with the women. And they, were, they looked like men. I mean, uh, Genesis 18 uh, with uh, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham standing by his tent. The Bible says that uh, in Genesis 18 that three men, uh, spell M-E-N, three men come walking up. And Abraham went out and bowed down and said, What is my Lord saying to his servant? And the, and the, and the, 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 the leader of the three uh, said, We are on our way to do business, to take care of some business. And, and Abraham says, Well, before you go, let us fix you dinner. And, the, and they said, No. And Abraham insisted. So the three said, All right, but make it quick. And so the Bible says in Genesis 18 that uh, Abraham and Sarah fixed dinner for the three men. They sat under a tree, had dinner, and two of the men got up and left. But the one stayed, and the Bible says that one who stayed with Abraham was the Almighty God, the Creator Himself. And then the other two that got up, and Genesis 19 goes on to say that those two that got up and went on were the two so-called angels that went into Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were, they were good-looking, handsome men. So I'm saying you need to go back and look at the Bible. You need to go back and look at the Scriptures, because I'm telling you, there's a lot there you have not been told. You're not privy to be told the real truth. The churches will tell you all kinds of things you want to hear, but they will not tell you the real truth. And it's about time, in this time of the end that we're living, that you need to take off your rose-colored glasses and not, and not and stop believing all the things that people have been telling you in churches, because all they're doing is giving you what they've been told in their, semin in their seminaries, where they have to go to get a degree. Well, and to get that degree, what they have to do is they have to prove that they can regurgitate what their professor teaches them, who had to prove that he could regurgitate what his professor taught, etc. And it's, it's a uh, perpetuation and a continuation of a lot of fiction and myth that way. Jordan, I had to cut you off in mid-sentence, but you were, you were explaining actually again that uh, the ones that mixed with women are the sons of God. They're not, uh, not angels. That's right, exactly. Angels are spirits. Uh, you know, spirits are not able to reproduce with women. You can't even see them. They're an energy field. They are spirits, or ghosts, so to speak. That's why we call it Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, because they're spirits. They're not bodies. They don't have physical bodies. <clears throat> then there are also um, different kinds of spirits. The Bible says there, there are disembodied spirits. There are there are spiritual uh, entities that we call angels. There are somebody, some some creatures that the Bible calls watchers, the watchers. That's another term. And then there's the sons of God. Well, the sons of God were the entities, these uh, creatures that were able to take on a physical form and actually uh, uh, reproduce with women, children. And so they were men, and they were, the Bible says they were good-looking men, handsome <clears throat> men. And so, uh, you know, and in the book of Genesis, it says that these three, uh, in Genesis 18, the three men that come walking up, as I said, and, and they all sat down, they had dinner uh, with Abraham and his wife, and then two of the men got up and left. Uh, one of them stayed, and the one that stayed, the Bible says, was the Almighty God, the Creator. Uh, and 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 and, uh, and Abraham just got through feeding Almighty God, the Creator, had dinner with him. Uh, that's not Jordan Maxwell's thing. That that's what the Bible says. Go read it in Genesis 18. Then in Genesis 19, it says that the two men which were were with uh, God, <clears throat> but got up or the same two men that entered into Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, and they were seen by the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah as good-looking, handsome men. And go read that in Genesis 19. So now we're, telling, now we're seeing 
that the three guys who walked up into the, the tent, uh, walked up to the tent, <clears throat> were two of them. The Bible says were good-looking men because they were the two sons of God who were in Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, if that's true, then the then the the whole idea of sons of God are different from spirits. They are able to come in and look like handsome men, take the women, reproduce, have sex with the women, and reproduce offspring. Uh, so, uh, well, if that's true, then uh, is that possibly true today, that there might be some of these uh, sons of God? Well, that's what the Apostle Paul said. Jordan Maxwell did not say that. The Apostle Paul said in the Scriptures, to be hospitable to all men, for some have entertained angels unaware. Which he was saying, be always hospitable to everyone, because you never know, you might be talking to one of the sons of God who looks like a human, who looks like a man, but is in fact not from this world. Well, okay, well, uh, Jordan, let me ask you a question. Um, are there... Um, are, are there uh, passages or statements in other types of, of ancient script other than the Bible uh, that talk about these same or similar concepts? Oh, gosh, yes. Oh, heavens, yes. My goodness. Uh, uh, they're filled with it. The Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, Upanishads, the Rig, Rig Veda, just in that area of the world. Then the ancient text of the uh, the Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Phoenician Canaanites, the Chaldeans, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans. My God, it's all over the world. I mean, all the ancient cultures from the Eskimos to South America to the, uh, to the uh, aboriginals of, of Australia, all the ancient texts of the world talk about, including the, the, what was referred to as the star people, that the Native Americans, all the Native American tribes know. I've talked with all the, the many of the leaders of the of the different tribes in America. They all talk about the star people, those who came here from above. And of course, Zachariah Sitchin's work on on the on the ancient scriptures of the world, talking about those who came down from above, the Nephilim. So yes, all over the world. There is, there is uh, discussions in all holy scriptures, all holy writings, talking about these other entities who have come here that look like us. And of course, as I said, Genesis 1 shows where God said, come let us, meaning more than one, come let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So he's not making man, he's remaking man. He's intervening in mankind's uh, evolution. And in relation to this, there's something I've wanted to bring out that I feel is very important. Okay, let me say to our caller, if you will, uh, just hang on. We'll get to you in just a moment. Go ahead. Genesis 1-2 is extraordinarily important. When the Bible says in Genesis 1-2, and the earth was without form and void, is a mistranslation. It does not say that in the original. It is a mistranslation. The King James people were great with the King's English, and they weren't that good with Hebrew. And we note that there's been a lot of trouble and a lot of problems translating back then. So when we read that in the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth, and the earth was without form and void. On the, on the face of it, that's ludicrous. Anything God would create it has no form, and it's void. What are you talking about? God created something, and we find out that it has no form, and it's void. What does that mean? Well, the reason why it sounds crazy is because it is. It's not what the original scripture says. In the original, it says, and the earth, and the earth became a waste and a desolation was not without form and void. No, the Hebrew word is tohu vavohu. And the rabbis will tell you tohu vavohu is only used in the Bible twice in the Old Testament. Once in Genesis 1-2, where the correct word, the correct translation is, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became a waste and a desolation. That's important because if you go back to the Jeremiah 2, the second chapter of Jeremiah, 
tohu vavohu is also used there. It's only twice in the scriptures <clears throat> that tohu vavohu is used. Jeremiah 2 talks about, Jeremiah says he was given a vision by God. And in that vision, he saw the earth. He said, I saw the earth when it was a meeting place for the gods. It was a meeting place for the gods. And it was beautiful cities. There were beautiful cities and, and, and beautiful buildings. And the beautiful animals and the birds were many. And, the, and it was a beautiful place. And it was a meeting place. And then, uh, Jeremiah says, and then I saw, God showed me, tohu vavohu. The earth became a waste and a desolation. It wasn't formless and void. No, it became a waste and a desolation. Meaning, from Jeremiah and Genesis 1-2, that there was a time when the earth was a host, uh, was the host of other life forms, the meeting of the gods, so to speak. But then the earth became a waste and a desolation, meaning there must have been some kind of a profound war broke out on the earth in which there was nuclear uh, uh, holocaust, some kind of a terrible holocaust happened on the earth whatever it was, and the earth became a waste and a desolation. The word in Hebrew, tohu vavohu. Go back and do your homework. Adam and Eve were not the first people on the earth. After this great, terrible catastrophe, tohu vavohu, God says, come let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and then let us remake him. Go forth, multiply, and re." Plenish the earth. All right, we we need to go back to the phone line now, Jordan. Uh, caller, you are live on the Kevin Smith Show. Your first name and from where are you calling? Kevin, this is Brent from Wyoming. Hi, Brent. And I'm going to postulate something for you. Postulate away, sir. The, in the towards the beginning of the show, Jordan was talking about how the government officials disclosed by denial. Now. Is it possible that that is a calling process so that whenever, ha whatever, whenever whatever happens, those who are panicked will be separated from those who are more or less prepared? How would it, how would it work as a culling process? Those who, those who do not even want to think about this, these, these, these things will panic. It will be blood in the streets, as they say. Okay. What do you think, Jordan? Uh, those who are will, will not pay. They'll just sit back and let it happen. All right. What do you think, Jordan? Well, I think there's something to that. Yeah, it sounds about reasonable because there's obviously going to be a lot of people who are not prepared. and uh, They're going to flip, and there's no doubt about that. Like Gerald Salenti says, when people lose everything, they lose it. Well, it's true. And if, and if, and if as I said, the possibility... I don't know. I'm not uh, the world's foremost authority on any of this, but there is, if there is a possibility that there very well might be an invasion, uh, which I think is probably uh, probably what's happening, if that is the case, boy, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to flip out, and they most likely will be people who are very religious and have the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and they know the whole thing and they've got it all nailed down, and one day they find out they never had any truth at all, and this is the real truth. The real truth is that you were not reading and not doing your homework, and you were deceived, and now you're faced with something you can't even imagine. So I think that there's a, there, there may very well might be something to what he's saying. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brent. Jordan, very quickly, uh, we have... Um Umberto in Mexico, who writes that uh, he would like to know if the fallen angels are the ones involved with the secret space program. That would not surprise me a bit. My hunch, and of course I don't know, but my subjective opinion, my hunch is yes, that's what I think is happening. I think that we uh, are being led in our governmental systems and our space program by very possible extraterrestrials who look like humans, and they are leading us 
to do something that's ultimately going to be very unhappy for us. But we're being led into it because we're so pompous and arrogant that we think we're going to do something important, like go to the moon and go to Mars, which we're probably already on. And we, you know, we're, we're stepping out into space and look at us. Aren't we important? Never realize that we're being led into this by some higher intelligences that are looking like humans. So I, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that were the case. Kevin, I'd like to make a quick statement, too. I wanted to clarify my feelings about God. A lot of people have made all kinds of accusations about me, <clears throat> bearing false witness against their neighbor without having any real knowledge of my person and my, and my beliefs or anything. Uh, I have the highest respect for God. I believe that there is a God uh, which is ultimately the, the, the ultimate power in all the universe. So I have no, no problem with, with understanding that there's a higher divine presence in the world of, uh, and, the, and the creation of all the universe, which uh, we refer to as God. I mean, uh, you know, a loose term is God. Uh, simply God is dog spelled backwards. It's just a word. But I do believe that there is a divine presence, and I have the highest respect and admiration for God. So I just want under, I want people to understand. I'm not talking about space aliens and I'm drunk or I'm on drugs. No, I'm talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the the great creator of the universe. And I realize that God is too big for one religion. That, that, the, that whatever it is we're talking about out there, that's the superior mind and power in all the universe, is far, far superior to anything that we can comprehend. And therefore, um, I have the highest respect for God. I have little to no respect for people who think that they're religious, and their particular religion is the only one on the earth, and everybody else is wrong. So... Now, don't accuse me of being an atheist. I, I have the highest of respect for God, and if it weren't for God, I don't even think I'd be here today. I think I'd be protected and spiritually guided because I want, I want the truth. I want to research and study and know the truth. The Scripture admonishes you to uh, search the Scriptures daily to, to make yourself uh, knowledgeable on everything because your mind, the way God created our brains, your mind's like a parachute. Don't work if it ain't open. <laughs> I've always had an open mind. I want to read and study and be able to converse intellectually with anyone on my beliefs and why I believe what I do and the belief I have in God. I want to be able to intellectually discuss that with anyone at any time. And I do that on stages at universities and uh, great meeting halls where I can sit with the best out as there and at least sound intelligent about my particular beliefs. Well, that's what we're admonished to do. So I'm not an atheist. I'm not an agnostic. I believe in God. And I believe in the divine presence that we call God. But I also realize that there's only two places in the in the Old Testament. Only two places in the Old Testament. The word God is a word which means a divine spiritual presence in all of creation, in all the universe. There's a divine spiritual presence that is referred to as God, uh, that is the ultimate, ultimate power. But there's only two places in the scriptures in the Old Testament that use the word God, meaning that all other places where the word God is used is Elohim, the gods. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand there's a very big difference between God and the gods. Uh, there's, a, just, there's just an entire world of knowledge that most people have not been privy to know, and anyone who brings out this knowledge nowadays is going to be looked at like a fruitcake. And I'm not stupid. I'm just doing my homework, and I'm telling everyone that they should do the same. I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. But I've been reading and studying for 50 years. Theology, religion, world government, world banking. I know something about what's going on. And I've had my name drug through the mire and drug through the, the ashes because people are not understanding. I'm not, I'm not evil. I'm just trying to awaken my fellow man to, to the fact that there's so much going on in this world we have not been told. So I'm suggesting we all might want to take a look at what we believe and go back and do some real legitimate homework. 
Well, uh, my stance on all of that is pretty simple, and that is I don't believe anything. And when I say that, people say, oh, well, then you're an atheist. No, atheism is a belief. That's right. Okay. When I say I don't believe anything, what I'm saying is either I know it or I don't know it yet. And I have to study some more, and I have to uh, uh, right. investigate right. some more and re- research some more. Right. Now, the reason I've chosen that position is because if you nail down and say, okay, this is what I believe, uh, the tendency is to go no further. Yep, you're right. I agree, and that's a, that's a very interesting point. That doesn't mean you're an atheist. It just means that you you don't know everything yet. So if you know if you don't know, then don't say you believe. Mm-hmm. You know? I would rather know something for sure. I'm quite comfortable with being uh, coming to the end of the evidence and saying, well, I don't know. Well, but too. a lot of people are not comfortable with that, and so they fill in the blank at the end of the evidence with believe. Well, now, I'm, I'm not critical of it. Yeah, I'm not critical of it. I'm just, I'm just saying that's not me. Oh, well, that's not me either. My rabbi said, a uh, friend said, there are two kinds of religious facts, the kind you look up and the kind you make up. 